Hi, I'm Alexi O'Donnell. I am a bioarchaeologist and I work at the University of Mississippi uh, in Oxford, Mississippi, and I'm going to give you a brief introduction to bioarchaeology today. So first I want to talk about why we study skeletons. So probably the first, I guess, reason you might study them is because our culture is uh, fascinated and repulsed, I think, by death. Uh, not every culture is fascinated or repulsed by death. And for some people, it's more incorporated into kind of everyday life. But in American culture, I would say that that is less so. So the study of the skeleton in general has this really long, um, sometimes sorted tradition um, in anatomical studies for medical purposes. So the skeleton is obviously really important medicine. And the skeleton for anthropologists like me provides a really informative and helpful piece of information about how people lived, uh, how people died, what they ate, and I'll talk about that more in a second. So a thing I, should, I have to hit on before I get too deep into bioarchaeology is that our skeleton is alive. We might not think of it as being this living thing, but it is. Um, it makes our red blood cells, it stores our fat, it stores calcium, it protects all of our squishy bits. So without this hard framework, without our skeleton, uh, we wouldn't be alive probably, or we'd be big blobs of jello, which would make us pretty useless. So the skeleton, because it's alive, it records things that we go through as we travel throughout life. So if you break your arm, your skeleton breaks clearly, but then it makes a new callus of bone and it'll heal that fracture. Eventually it'll fully heal, but evidence of that fracture doesn't necessarily go away. And it's the same with some infections or instances of like malnutrition. So our skeletons and our teeth create this almost indelible record of things we do, things we did, things we ate, and things we experienced, which is what makes them really exciting for anthropologists. So two examples of disease processes, I just picked a couple that are interesting, that leave marks on our skeleton. Um, I'm going to talk about two, but the first one is scurvy. Humans and guinea pigs cannot create vitamin C themselves. So uh, it's really interesting because guinea pigs are one of the only other cre creatures aside from humans where this is an issue. Most other creatures actually make and basically synthesize their own vitamin C. So they don't need a supplement of vitamin C to survive. But guinea pigs and humans do. So we have to eat things that have vitamin C or else we get something called scurvy. You probably associate scurvy with pirates and seafaring people, then you wouldn't be incorrect. And there's actually this military surgeon who uh, figured out, in the case of scurvy, to fix it, you just need some citrus. For those of you who live in New Mexico, what's even more exciting than citrus is if you eat green chili, which has more vitamin C than lemons and oranges. So I suggest you just eat your green chili and you'll never get scurvy. Uh, so scurvy basically makes it, uh, if you have lack of vitamin C, uh, your collagen, which is stored in your skeleton, it can't be re replaced. Um, it leads to this breakdown of your tissues. And what this deficiency can do and how it leaves a mark on your skeleton is that it actually makes your bones porous. And that goes along with uh, things like, and other things that happen, I guess, to your body, not going along with, but your gums can bleed, uh, your teeth can get loose. Uh, you can get big sores on your skin. And this picture at the bottom right-hand side of your screen kind of shows you an example of some pictures of scurvy from a medical textbook. Another disease in this case that can impact your skeleton, although it does it very, very rarely, uh, is uh, tuberculosis. So tuberculosis is kind of characterized as this romantic disease, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries. It's caused by a bacterium uh, called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, so this is an infectious disease. It primarily impacts your lungs, but it can impact other parts of your body. And today, there are roughly 2 million fatalities directly related to tuberculosis a year worldwide. So keep that in mind today, tuberculosis is still a disease that really impacts people. Uh, and there are drug resistant strains and strains that are emerging as drug resistant. So they're not like antibiotics aren't working on them. So tuberculosis is pretty bad, but what's kind of interesting, it very rarely, like I said, impacts bones. But when it does, which is maybe two to 3% of cases, it leaves really specific marks. 
So what you see here are your vertebrae or your backbone, and you see these holes in the bone. Well, the holes don't belong there. Uh, and that is a sign that you've had tuberculosis. So tuberculosis, in my opinion, is not so romantic. Symptoms of active tuberculosis are a chronic cough with blood in your sputum, uh, fevers, night sweats, weight loss. So the whole historical term for this disease is consumption. And it's because it's basically because of that weight loss, you look like you're being consumed. So like I said, this disease impacts people today. And then if you've ever watched Gone with the Wind, you probably recognize this woman. This is Vivian Lee. She's famous for her role as Scarlett O'Hara. But what she's not as famous for is that she died from tuberculosis in 1967. So these are two diseases of many that can impact your skeleton. Our skeletons don't have that many ways that they actually react to insults or illnesses, just a couple. And these are two diseases that really impact your skeleton or can. So back to why we might study a skeleton. Uh, so studying skeletons, it's really important for a lot of fields. As I mentioned before, I think medicine would be the most obvious place where skeletal studies are really important. We want our doctors to know about our skeleton so they can treat our diseases and our ailments. And if we break a bone, we want them to be able to fix it. But you can maybe imagine knowing about bones being really important in forensic settings, because in the case of a forensic investigation, probably sometimes all you have left is a person's skeleton. And I would say, last but not least here is bioarchaeology. So uh, forensic anthropology and bioarchaeology have quite a bit of overlap, and I'll kind of hit on that in a minute. But since we're here about bioarchaeology, uh, bioarchaeology is the contextual study of the biology culture and evolution of human populations from skeletal remains interpreted within archaeological and historical context. So the main goal of bioarchaeology is to understand how people lived in the past. So we study the dead to get at their lived experience. Bioarchaeology as a term is coined by Dr. Jane Bykstra in the 1970s in the United States. And it emerges at the same time that we see some big changes happening in American archaeology. So the goal of American bioarchaeology is much the same as the goals of the new archaeology or processual archaeology movement of the 1970s. The goal, probably today, even today, the goal is anthropological problem solving rather than kind of descriptive data collection. So American bioarchaeology focuses on this recreation of life histories and population structure. And bioarchaeology exists in the UK as well. Uh, it, they develop independently of each other, and they do have some overlap. But I think I would say they do things a little bit differently. So what can you learn from looking at a skeleton uh, and teeth, which I'll talk about really briefly? Uh, you can learn a whole bunch. So you can learn about health. Uh, you can learn about diseases that people had, their disease load. Um, levels of illness in a population, whether there are disabilities. Uh, you can learn about things like migration, so population histories, uh, marriage patterns. Uh, you can learn about how society was organized. So if there's inequality, marginalization, how do those impact people? How does colonization impact our skeletons? Uh, violence, all of those things you can see evidence for in your skeleton. We can also learn about people's ritual and spiritual beliefs because how we treat the dead, where we put them when we bury them or dispose of them after they're dead, tells us a lot about kind of people's relationships with the dead and how they interface with them. Uh, you can learn about people's ancestry, uh, identity, uh, not ancestry, I'll get there in a sec. What was it like to be a little kid in the past? What's it like to um, be maybe like what's your ancestry um what's your ethnicity what are your experiences based on those things what are your experiences based on gender even though we don't estimate gender from a skeleton uh paleo demography how long do people live was child mortality high was fertility high um we can also learn more like this is about today secular change which are things that are changing in our current society our current culture uh, stature, obesity, the time you start your period, any of those things. Uh, maybe you can't learn about the period from the skeleton, but that's an example of secular change. And uh, you can uh, identify unknown people, unknown skeletal remains uh, through forensic identification through the construction of something called the biological profile. 
So bioarchaeologists and forensic anthropologists will use a biological profile. And this is a thing you have to do before you can really learn about a culture or a people. So the biological profile, when we estimate it, we uh, do an inventory of a person's skeleton. We estimate their sex. Um, so sex, you just have to remember, is biologically driven and your gender is a social construct. A bioarchaeologist, we can't determine your gender. We can only determine your sex, your age. Uh, your ancestry, so that's your heritage, kind of where are you from, uh, your stature, how tall were you, and pathology, do you have evidence of disease or trauma, or malnutrition like scurvy. So we construct this profile, and that's when we are able to actually learn about uh, people or a group. So before I go over this case study, I just want to say that most of the time, bioarchaeologists are not trying to identify specific people. Often we're working to understand population or group level trends. So what are the bigger picture questions? Although some people write osteobiographies about a single person and talk about their lived experience. Um, and that's what I'm gonna give you an example of here. Uh, but when you're thinking of forensic anthropology, they're going to use that biological profile to try to identify a specific person. So you can consider the case study I'm about to show you, a mixed bag of bioarchaeology, forensic anthropology, and some good historical detective work. In 2012, bioarchaeologists from the University of Leicester, they set out to find King Richard III's grave. So King Richard is really interesting. He's the last English king to have died in battle, and he was long thought to have been buried in Greyfriars Churchyard. The researchers kind of felt that finding him would be actually next to impossible, but they thought that excavating this churchyard where he was buried or thought to be buried would be really great for learning about other people who were maybe weren't as famous who lived during the same time period so it was worth a try and what's really interesting is that they're digging and they run across this skeleton and immediately they think it's king richard iii so there are several things that hint at it and one major thing is that he has this skeletal anomaly which almost certainly gives it away so he has a spinal curvature what's called scoliosis so you can see that curvature in this picture at the right. This is the skeleton in situ or in the grave. So what you can see here is that it's sitting up. He's in this kind of propped up position. His head is not laying flat. It's propped up against the edge of that grave, um, which maybe indicates a hasty burial. You can still see his spinal curvature really clearly in both of these pictures. So after they excavate King Richard, what they do is a full skeletal analysis and they construct that biological profile. So what we know from the full skeleton is that this individual was an adult male in his 20s to 30s. So the king was about 32 years old when he died. He was about five foot eight. He definitely has that pathology, that scoliosis, which you can see really clearly in this picture. And he has multiple wounds that he suffered perimortem. So perimortem means wounds incurred around time of death in his case. So he has multiple wounds that he incurred right around the time that he died. Researchers identified 11 of them. This is his skull, and this is the back of his skull. So it's this part of your head right here. And uh, the injuries to the skull, including this really massive one you see here, indicate that he was hit with a bladed weapon, uh, a sword maybe, multiple times. So this wound is likely the blow that ends his life. Uh, it's equally likely, though, that he endured other wounds. Uh, that they couldn't see on the skeleton, which happens a lot, uh, which may have also been fatal. So in the end, uh, what they do with this biological profile is they're like, okay, this is a male. The skeletal remains are kind of ambiguous in a lot of respects, but it's male. And Richard in life was reported to be very slim and slight and kind of a small guy. So that's what they see with his skeleton. He's about five foot eight, but he's about that height. His scoliosis was really severe, so it would have given him hunchback appearance and Richard is reported to have been a hunchback in the literature. Uh, he suffered multiple injuries from a sharp object at his time of death. Well we know he died in battle on August 22nd 1485 during this battle of Bosworth. So we know that if you die in battle you're probably more likely to exhibit those kinds of wounds. He buried in this grave that's too short for him so that indicates a hasty burial which kind of mimics all accounts of his burial and the historical written record of his burial. And finally, the researchers got 
someone who is thought to be a descendant of King Richard. So they know she's a descendant because of genealogy. Let me track it down. She supplies her DNA, which they use to identify his remains squarely as King Richard III. And these pictures over here that you see are images of uh, Richard being buried at the top, it's right before burial. And then the bottom image is actually this guy named Lawrence Stanley finding Richard's circlet or his crown after the battle in which he died and he hands it to this man named Henry. Henry later gets crowned king. So that is bioarchaeology and the bioarchaeological profile, which we use for everything in a little tiny nutshell. And the one last thing, because I didn't talk about them as much, but you can never forget teeth. So teeth can tell us almost everything that the skeletons can. There's some obvious exceptions. You probably can't figure out how somewhat tall someone was from their teeth. But almost everything else you can, and enamel is one of the hardest substances in the body. So it basically records a bunch of different stuff and it's really durable. So I just wanted to not uh, leave teeth out of the equation here. Thank you for your time.